Welcome to the Atmosphere Church channel. On behalf of all of us here at Atmosphere, thank you for watching. We pray that this message will touch your heart and change your life. Regardless of what you believe, where you come from, or what questions you might have, you are welcome here. Our desire is to help lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more information about us, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. And don't forget to click below to subscribe. Enjoy the message. Hi everybody, Pastor Phil here from Atmosphere Church, filling in for Pastor Jim, who's on a sabbatical for the month of July, and we're happy for that. We want him to get refreshed and renewed. So we're gonna have some guest speakers. I'm the first one, and so let's press on. I have a short video I want you to see, so check this out. Score is 52-16. Let's see if either of these two women can challenge that. The little Muhammad always gets out fast and aggressive, and she is doing that right now. This is a woman who's only run three races up to this point. But when you talk about being a tactician and executing perfectly, that's the little Muhammad. But Sydney McLaughlin looks very comfortable through half of the race. And throughout the rounds, we have seen monster finishes by Sydney McLaughlin. Does she have one more? Because the world record holder is putting some distance between her and the rest of the field. And look at Shamir Little come on the inside. Got a little off balance there. This is Sydney McLaughlin challenging Dalila Muhammad. Sydney McLaughlin gets ahead of the world champion and the Olympic champion. Sydney's time is now. And what does that time look like? 52, 51 for your own. That's a new world record. The first woman ever. That was a pretty cool video. Let me ask you, have you ever run a race? I want to read a, a passage real quickly here. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. The Apostle Paul says, Don't you realize that in a race everybody runs, but only one person wins the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So run with a purpose, run to win. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever ran in track and field? As a young man, quite a while back, I did. I used to run what was affectionately known as the 220 and the 440. And in a race, you have to ask yourself, what is important? Of course, you have the start. The sprinter is in the blocks and they're waiting for the gun. And when the gun goes off, they dig in and they're pushing as hard as they can for about the first 10 yards. And after that 10 yards, they start to straighten up and they reach their stride and they're pushing on and pushing on. And at the end, they come to the finish line. Yes. And they win the race. But let me ask you, what's most important about that whole triplet that I just shared. Is starting important? Yes, of course starting is important. But is it most important? No, sometimes you can burst out of the blocks and you can have a slow start or you might stumble. But you can recover. When you're in mid-stride, you can be pushing and pushing as hard as you know, but you might miss a step a little bit. Is that the most important thing? The most important thing is to cross the finish line first and foremost. And that's what I want to talk about. You and I running the race. The race is that life that God has given us. This is for people of faith, for lovers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even for people who don't have faith, we are all in a race, so to speak. And it began, if you will, figuratively with our birth. We have a life that God has given us and we're running a race with that life, wanting to finish well. And let me just say, usually it's not a sprint. Usually it's an endurance race. 
And so our form is important, but every once in a while you can get a, a, a cramp in your side. You might stumble in the beginning. I know people. There was a young man many years ago, my wife and I have been loving the Lord for decades, and this was in the late 70s. That's 1970s, not 1870s. But be that as it may, we had a Bible study and there was five or 15 people there. And this guy named Joey shows up and we'd never met him before. And he just shot out of the blocks. He was sharing and sharing. He was excited about this. He was excited about that. But I had this little funny feeling about him, not a bad feeling, but a, a funny feeling. Well, the next week he came and didn't have anything to say. And it was kind of comical because he had a really fast start, but then he stumbled. Now, it's been decades. I hope that he's walking and living with the Lord and doing well, but it was kind of interesting. You can start really on fire and the fire can go out, or you can stumble at the beginning, but that's not what's important. What is important is finishing well. What is important is crossing the line. And so in this passage, again, same passage, 1 Corinthians 9, the apostle says, don't you realize that in a race we all run? Run to win. And that's what I want to encourage you and me and all of us in. Let's run this race in such a way as we win and we bring honor to the Lord Jesus Christ and we are a blessing to the people round about us. He goes on, the apostle says in this passage, people who run in track and field, the Olympics and other things, they run for a prize that will perish. It wasn't too long ago I was over at a friend's house and he had an Oscar on his mantle, you know, a real one. And I went over, he said it was okay. I picked it up and it was very, very heavy. But it was interesting because I sat it down and it was just this funny kind of tarnished gold thing. We could have earthly prizes that fade away. But when we run for the kingdom of God, when we run to bring honor to Jesus, and we'll talk about how we do that in just a few minutes, it is an eternal prize we're running for. Another passage, check this one out. Hebrews chapter 12, verses one and two. I love this. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Now, if you'll notice in track and field, like that video we just saw, they're not wearing much. They have shorts on and a shirt or something like that, and then specially made shoes. That's all. They're not wearing jeans. They're not wearing funny shoes. They don't have a jacket on. They have stripped off everything that would hinder them and hold them back. And figuratively speaking, as we are running our race for Christ, we have to consider what do we have to strip off. Again, Hebrews 12, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially, now he's the writer of Hebrews is getting more specific, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance, there you go, run with endurance the race that God has set before you. How do we strip off the things that entangle us? What are the things that entangle us? Well, that sometimes necessitates you and I being honest and brutal with the facts as they pertain to us. I'm a big believer that it's important for us to be, if you will, brutal. What am I struggling with? What are you struggling with? You might be struggling with envy. You might be struggling with bitterness. You might be struggling with covetousness. You might be struggling with pornography and drugs and sex and whatever the case might be, unforgiveness. But when you recognize those things, it's important for us to take the steps to lay them aside. And we'll talk about the how-tos on that a little bit in a few minutes. But if I'm gonna run a race effectively, if I'm gonna run a race and run in such a way as to win, when I recognize that there's something that's weighing me down, I have got to slow down, take some time, and strip it off. And as I said, we'll talk about that in a few moments. I love this passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 8. This is the new language translation. I just like the way it's translated. Translated. It says, "Finishing is better than starting." Amen. I might have started well, I might have started poorly, but the goal is we are called to finish the race. That's what it's all about. 
some people, we, we, we lose our passion or they lose their passion. I want to, by God's grace and, and sharing with you, stir up that passion so you can keep on running and keep on running because there's a reward that goes on into eternity. Finishing is better than starting. And so uh, in a different translation, that passage is translated this way. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. So there are three things I believe that we can look at that will make you and I a winner in our race for Christ. And one is refocusing. Whatever you're looking at, whatever is the center of your focus, whatever is consuming your thoughts and your mind and your attention, that's going to be the monster in your life. And so what I want to encourage you to do is learn how to change your focus from something that's contrary to the things of the kingdom of God. So we want to refocus on God. Let me just read a few things that are pretty cool to think about. We can consider these things as we'll talk. We can look at God's love, his forgiveness, his patience, his kindness, his generosity, his willingness to help you and me, his protection, the fact that he has promised to change us. He empowers us. He gives us wisdom. He gives us purpose. He gives us direction. He makes us more than conquerors. Amen. Through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. He illumines our paths and he leads us to green pastures and places us in rest and restoration no matter how big the mess you and I have made. We can make a huge mess. I sometimes picture in my mind my walk with the Lord Jesus Christ or to continue the the metaphor, my running the race. But you know what? Sometimes in a race you can stumble and fall. Sometimes those sins that so easily entangle us can really, really wound us. And sometimes in my mind's eye, when I consider such things, I see myself running, if you will, and I fall in face first into a big old ugly muddy pit and I'm lying there. But here's what I also recognize because I recognize based on the teaching of the scripture what God says about us. He says he loves us as I just read. He'll be there for us. And so when we fall, I see in my mind's eye, so to speak, Jesus coming up and getting into the muck and the mire with us. And he reaches his hand down and he's reaching for me or he's reaching for you and he's just waiting for us. And I picture myself looking up embarrassed, perhaps full of shame, perhaps angry, whatever the case might be. But Jesus is just waiting for me to lift my hand up and he grabs that hand because he promises he will never leave us or forsake us. And he picks me up and he cleans me off. And I see, if you will, a smile on his face as if he says, come on, let's get back in the race. That's what it's all about. So we refocus. We refocus on God. And I think the first thing to focus on is his love. You know, we're told from the beginning about God's love. He loves us. He loves us. And indeed he does. Look at this passage in 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 and 8. The writer says, dear friends, let us love one another. That's important. I mean, that's something that we should be prioritizing. Loving one another, loving God. But it says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. I have some atheist friends. I've known them for a long time, but I believe personally that if they were correct, if there was no God, and the scripture says love comes from God, I believe if there was no God, there would be no such a thing as love existence in the cosmos. We would all be driven and compelled by selfish self-interest, narcissistic, what's best for me? But the scripture says, where love comes from God, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know God does not know love because God is love. God at his very core, think about that, at his very core, he is love. And boy, is that good news. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to finish well. And when you fall, he doesn't get mad. He 
just wants to pick you up and clean you off and smile and encourage you and press, help you press on. So we have to focus, I believe, first and foremost on God's love. Here's another great passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and following. Watch this. Because of God's great love for us. See, it all comes out of love. John 3, 16. For God so loved that he gave. Here in Ephesians, because of God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. And it's important that you understand that. We read about God's mercy and we read about God's grace. God's mercy is when we don't get what we deserve. It's the mercy of God when we don't get what we deserve. God's grace is when he gives us that which we don't deserve. And mercy and grace walk hand in hand. And it says here, because of God's great love for you, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sins. It was by grace we have been saved and then look what happens as a result of God's love and his great mercy. It says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. That's a mind blower. If you think about that, it's absolutely astonishing because of God's love for you. He wants you to be a success. That doesn't mean we're perfect. That's why he died for our sin. But he wants to make you and I a success. And he's helping us to press on to the goal that we might cross the line and celebrate in victory. And part of that victory, when we go home to be with the Lord, he is going to exalt us, raise us up, and seat us with him in the heavenly places. Watch this. In order... He's doing all of that in order that in the coming ages, and we're talking about on into eternity, on into paradise, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? We've been called, we've been forgiven, rescued, from the penalty of our sin, the scripture says the wage of sin is death. The soul that sins shall die. And Jesus, by dying on the cross in your place and my place, said it is finished. The debt is paid. Not only is the debt paid, but because of his great mercy and his great grace, he is exalting us and seating us with him in the heavenlies. Now, don't misunderstand me. That doesn't mean we're going to be equal with God. That doesn't mean we're going to become God. He is always the Almighty but he is raising us up and for the purpose that he might show more and more of his incomparable riches for us. That's a mind blower. That's a mind blower. Another passage, we don't have to turn there, but just a quick reference. We're talking about love. You look at uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and it says at the end of that passage, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. The love of Jesus will never fail you, never fail me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's good news. Love, just a quick aside, is not an emotion. It's a decision to commit. Years ago, when my wife and I shared our wedding vows, way back in January of 1976, the vows went something like this. I vow to be with you in the good times, and in the bad times, in the rich times, and in the poor times, in sickness and in health. See, that's what love does. It's a commitment. So we focus first on God's love. We've started the race. We're running the race. We're digging in, and we focus on the love of God because the race is a spiritual race. And by the way, a quick aside, not really, but a quick explanation. We're not racing against one another. We are racing against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are racing against spiritual powers and striving by the grace of God to become more and more, if you will, successful. We'll talk about more of that in just a moment. We also want to refocus on God's power. If I'm focused on something other than God, then I'm not going to be able to really realize that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly in my life. That God 
has the power to accomplish what he is determined to accomplish. And what he's determined to accomplish, if we will cooperate with him, because our free will is a factor, is he wants to make you and me winners, so to speak, of the eternal race. I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about possessions. I'm talking about the things that are important. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, being a witness for Christ. I mean, when we talk about focusing on God's power, we won't turn there. But just think of the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. One of my absolute favorite verses is just, it comes from Genesis 1, 1, and it's just the first few words. In the beginning, God. How cool is that? But let me encourage you. It's not only in the beginning, God. It's in the middle, God. It's in the end, God. It's all of God. He is running with you. Last week, Pastor Jim made reference to a passage in Matthew where Jesus said, take my, take my yoke upon you, for my load is easy and my burden is light. And God is running with us, wanting to bear the yoke so that we can be winners in this race. The power of God we want to focus on. In Psalm 33, 6, it says this, the Lord merely spoke, and the heavens were created. He breathed the word, and all the stars were born. Now, I kind of am a fan of cosmology, and current science tells us that the, cos uh, the universe is approximately 13.8 billion light years in size. And if you had had a camera and could have been on the outside filming from the Big Bang, Boom! And all of a sudden there's this explosion, so to speak. And the universe is expanding. But if you rewound that camera, the universe would contract, the big crunch, and it would come back to a place of singularity. And one moment before that, technically you can't use phrases like that in, at this point, but at one moment before that, nothing except God who exists outside of space and time. And he merely spoke and the world, and the cosmos, the totality of the known universe came into existence. That's the God that loves you. In fact, here's a mind blower. That God who spoke the world into existence became a man. That one who walked on water that one who raised Lazarus, that one who caused the blind to see, he was and is, he was God become man. And so when we focus on his love and then we focus on his power, when I realize the power of God and that he's committed to me in his love, what, is it, what it does is give me great hope. I can keep on keeping on. In Psalm 145, 5 and 6, it says this, But joyful, yes, are those who have the God of Israel as their helper. See, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He made heaven, he made earth, he made the sea and everything in them, and he keeps every promise forever. How's that for good news? So we can be filled with joy, knowing that God is our helper, and that when we've become, be, begun that race that the Apostle Paul talked about, he's there with us. He's there at the beginning, he's there in the middle, and he's there in the end, and that's really good news. Ephesians 3.20, we want to focus on God's ability, watch this, to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think according to his power that works within us. What an incredible passage. God will do in you, in me, exceedingly abundantly beyond all that I would ask or think. And I can ask and think pretty substantially. I want to be the man that God wants me to be. I want to learn how to love and forgive and be an encourager. I want to learn how to run the race and care for the hurting and the poor and the outcasts. I want to run the race, and the Lord Jesus says, by His grace, by His power, the Holy Spirit in you and me, we can do exceedingly abundantly beyond. So, you know, in, in the book of James, it says, 
You have not because you ask not, and you ask and don't receive because you ask with poor motives, wanting to get things for yourself. Well, put that silliness aside. Ask God to make you the individual that he wants you to be. Ask him to free you up from the sins that so easily entangle us. He will do it. He loves doing that sort of thing. So we refocus on God's love and on his power. Amen. Now I want to talk about retooling. The key to winning the race is refocusing and then retooling. What I mean by that is God has tools or gifts or or abilities for you and I that will make us more effective. Callings, gifts, abilities. We need to learn how to identify those areas of giftedness and develop them. And for those of you who are on campus here at Atmosphere, keep your ears and your eyes open because you'll hear about various classes that we're teaching, various life groups that are specifically designed to help you identify your areas of giftedness, not just charismatic gifts, which are really important, but those gifts that God has placed in you that help you be the individual that he's designed you to be. For example, when I first became a believer, I was 20 years old and I was scared to death to talk in front of people. I mean, really, really hated it. But It was interesting, one of the gifts that God placed in me, I think at my very core, the very foundational gift, is the gift of teaching. I get more excited teaching than virtually anything else. I used to lead worship for years and years, but teaching is the thing that floats my boat because it's the gift that dwells within me. You might have the gift of teaching, you might have a gift of faith, a gift of service and helps, All of us are gifted differently, but as we lock arms together, we can press on to the upward call of Christ and see the kingdom of God come and see people come to know the Savior, see sick people made well, body, soul, mind, and spirit, whatever God's doing. I want to encourage you, work to discover those areas of giftedness in your life so they can be developed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul says this, Though we walk in the flesh, meaning we're alive, physical, though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage our battle or war war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. A fortress is a stronghold, but God has said that we have weapons that aren't fleshly, but spiritually empowered, divinely powerful to tear down those strongholds. See, it's these weapons, these gifts, these abilities that we want to recognize and we want to refocus on God, and we want to, in focusing on God, retool, lay hold of those gifts so we are running the race and just cooking for the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on in this passage and says, we are destroying, look at this, arguments and all arrogance raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking, this is really important, we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You know where the battle is? The battlefield is in your mind. The battlefield is in your mind. The evil one and the world, well, the world, the flesh, the devil wants to convince you that you are a failure, wants to convince you that just satiate your flesh, go out and do drugs and sleep around and steal what you will as long as it makes you feel good. That's the way of the world, the flesh, and the devil. But God says he's given us weapons where we can destroy those fortresses and become victorious, laying hold of the abilities that he's given us and see glorious things happen. I believe that as we who love the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you don't know the Lord, you can start the race right now. You can start the race right now. It's simply and profoundly a matter of faith. Lord Jesus, I believe you are God. I believe you are the Savior. doesn't mean you have answers for every question but you've begun the race. Lord, I believe you died for my sin and you rose from the dead. And here's another cool one. He's coming back soon. 
But as we begin that race, he's promised to be with us. We don't have to turn there, but in Romans 12, it talks about various gifts. It talks about the gift of faith and teaching and knowledge and mercy and serving and other gifts. I have a good friend. Her name is Sue. She has a gift of, gift of hospitality. It's just a mind blower. If you come over to my house unexpectedly, well, let me give you an example. A dear friend of mine, her name is Jim, came over to our house. This was several years back, and this is a close friend of mine. And it was like 8 in the morning, and I had dad hair going on. I mean, I looked awful. And she knocked on the door, and I'm thinking, who's knocking on my door? And I looked through little people, and I looked at it, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, it's Jennifer. Oh, no. What am I going to do? I didn't even want to open the door. I looked funny, and I'm not good at hospitality, but I thought, well, I have to open the door for Jennifer. So I opened the door, and this is literally what she did. She looked at me, and she stepped back with her eyes real big, and she said, wow, you clean up well. Well, I don't have the gift of hospitality, but this other friend of ours, her name's Sue, if we showed up at her house, she has the gift of hospitality. She would invite us in if it was 1130 at night and feed us. That's what floats her boat. We all have different gifts. So we want to run the race so as to win. And how do we do that? We refocus on our Heavenly Father and on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just remind you, we refocus on the fact that he has his love and his forgiveness and his patience and his kindness and his generosity, his willingness to help, his protection that he'll change us, he'll empower us. He gives us wisdom and purpose and direction. He makes us more than conquerors through Christ. He illuminates our path no matter what kind of a mess we made. That's who he is, he is and that's what he's done for us. We want to refocus on him. The scripture says in Matthew 6, 31. Do not worry about what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall wear. For these things even unbelievers run after. But your heavenly Father knows you need these things. Now watch this. This is the Lord Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 33. Jesus says this. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. All the things you need for life, the food that you eat and the shelter that you need and the clothes that you wear, all the things you need, not all the things you want. The Apostle Paul said at one time, I've learned how to get by with much and I've learned how to get by with little. I've been walking with the Lord now for about 48 years. And you know what? There have been times where I had a lot and there have been times where it's been meager, but every time, I had a place to live. Every time I had food, every time I had clothing, etc. If you've never memorized a verse before, I want to encourage you, memorize Matthew 6, 33. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. When you do that, we're refreshed. When we refocus on God, when we retool, automatically refocusing on God and retooling brings about refreshing. Refocus, retool, refresh, and you'll be able to finish the race. In Psalm 37, 4, it says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desire of your heart. Seek first God's kingdom, and He will do it. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. And I take that to mean this. When we're delighting in Jesus, He takes out our earthly desires, our fleshly desires, and He places in us kingdom of God desires. And then we press on to the goal that God has for us. Lastly, this passage in Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, it says, now repent. Repent's an old word which means change your mind or refocus. If I'm focused on something over here that's contrary to God's purposes, the scripture says, repent, refocus, get your eyes back on Jesus. Now repent of your sins and turn to God, refocus, so that your sins may be wiped away. Thank you, Lord. And then times of refreshing will come from the presence of God. Let's sum it all up. We've been called to run the race, 
and we're running for an eternal prize. And God's called us to focus on Him. And I encourage you, focus on His love for you. He loves you so much. He knows the color of your eyes. He knows what you ate for breakfast this morning. He knows you're struggling here, but He knows the overcomer you will become if you just keep on focusing on Him. And when we refocus on Him, we also lay hold of the tools, the gifts, the callings. And when we lay hold of the cool tools, the gifts, and the callings, then we mature, times of refreshing will come. So having said that, let me pray real quickly for you. Father, I pray the blessing of God upon these men and women and myself as well. Help us to run the race well. Help us to keep in our focus your great love, your utter commitment. You won't forsake us. You won't leave us. And help us to recognize that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly. Soften our hearts. Open our eyes. And Lord, please deliver us from those things that so easily entangle us. God bless you. It's been fun sharing with you. Thank you for tuning in today to another great message from Atmosphere Church. If this message is spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, iTunes, Podcast, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe button. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you should see it right below this video. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be a part of our family. For more information about our church, go to our official webpage at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this service and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not only these things, but also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray that you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.